Welcome to Historia Ecclesiastica. My name is Daniel Sudi, and today we will be talking about St. Pope Clement of Rome in the inaugural chapter of Book 2, The Apostolic Fathers. If you could please like the video, please leave a comment, uh, share it on your social media accounts, and please subscribe. That would be very helpful to promoting the channel and the work of discovering church history. Let's begin with a prayer, and the prayer we're going to take is from the great prayer of Pope Clement the Great. Uh, it comes from his letter to the Corinthians in chapter 59. So uh, let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Holy Spirit, please help us to pray, and as we pray, help us to join our voices with the voices of the early church of the first century that may have heard these prayer, this prayer often on the lips of the Holy Father, Clement. Our hope is resting on your name, which is the primal cause of every creature. Having opened the eyes of our heart to the knowledge of you, who alone rests highest among the highest, holy among the holy, who layest low the insolence of the haughty, who destroyest the calculations of the heathen, who settlest the low on high and bringest low the exalted, who makest rich and makest poor, who killest and makest live, only benefactor of spirits and God of all flesh, who beholdest the depths, the eyewitness of human works, the help of those in danger, Savior of those in despair, the creator and guardian of every spirit, who multiplies nations upon earth, and from all made choice of those who love you through Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, through whom you instructed, sanctify, and honor us. We pray this prayer of praise through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So uh, in this video, we will be looking at an outline of St. Clement's life. We're going to review the history of the Church of Corinth that Clement was addressing. We're going to discuss the conditions in the Church of Rome, which he oversaw. We will overview uh, the late first century uh, Corinthian church. And then we will systematically read excerpts from the 65 chapter uh, letter to the Corinthians by St. Clement of Rome. So uh, who was St. Clement? So first of all, St. Clement was born around the year 35 AD in the city of Rome. St. Epiphanius believed he was ordained a presbyter, meaning a priest, by St. Peter and Paul uh, simultaneously, but that he declined to serve as a bishop until after Cletus' death, even though Peter uh, told Clement that he would like him to be a, uh, his successor. He declined this until after Cletus' death in 88 AD. Okay, so Origen, Eusebius, Epiphanius, and Jerome all identified him with the same Clement who was mentioned in Philippians chapter 4, verse 21. And uh, that Bible verse reads, And I entreat thee also, my sincere companion, help those women who have labored with me in the gospel with Clement and the rest of my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. This verse would indicate that St. Clement had labored alongside St. Paul uh, during St. Paul's missionary journeys. Clement worked with St. Paul during his first imprisonment in Rome from 60 to 61 AD. We read about him in Acts chapter 28, verse, uh, we read about this imprisonment, I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 28, verse 30 through 31. And he, St. Paul, remained two whole years in his own hired lodging, and he received all that came into him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence and without prohibition. So during St. Paul's house arrest in Rome, his first house arrest in Rome, Clement would have known him and, and come to work with him. Blessed Peter, the, pope, the first pope and the apostle, died in 65 AD. His successor was Pope St. Linus. Linus reigned as the second pope from 65 to 77 AD. Cletus succeeded him from 77 to 88 AD, and as mentioned earlier, uh, Clement would be the third successor to Peter. Clement would be the fourth pope. He would rule the universal church from 88 AD to 99 AD. So he is famous mostly for his epistle to the Corinthians. So St. Clement wrote an address to the church of Corinth. He wrote this after the persecution of Domitian, which took place between the years 89 to 96 AD. He opened his letter saying, Owing, dear brethren, to the sudden and successive calamitous events that have happened to ourselves, we feel that we have been somewhat tardy in turning our attention to the points respecting which you consulted us. Um, so there's a couple things here that I'm sure we'll talk about in a little bit. First of all, um, St. Clement uses the third person uh, to refer to himself as a sign of royal dignity 
and that is the traditional uh, way in which uh, holy popes would address um, their, they would write their letters in the third person. That's the way that monarchs would typically write. It's sort of a way of implying that they are writing not only on their own behalf, but on behalf of the institution which they hold, the institution of authority which they hold. So it's not just he's writing, um, it's in a sense he is writing on behalf of the Church of Rome, but he's writing this letter. It's not like the whole church is sitting down writing it together, but he's using the third person to refer to his authority. Also, um, we feel we have been somewhat tardy in turning our attention to the points respecting which you consulted us. That's something to draw our attention to. The Church of Corinth consulted the Pope to ask for advice about an issue. So they saw some sort of authority in the Pope, of course, here. Um, however, uh, Pope Clement felt the need to apologize for not writing back to them sooner because of the calamitous events that happened to them. He's experiencing, as the Bishop of Rome, uh, severe persecution under Emperor Domitian. And um, so that's why he's apologizing for not addressing him sooner. Now, what is he writing about? What was the concern going on in Corinth that the Corinthians were asking for advice about? So this letter is being written in response to, quote, that shameful and detestable sedition, utterly abhorrent to the elect of God, which a few rash and self-confident persons have kindled, to such a pitch of frenzy that your venerable and illustrious name, worthy to be universally loved, has suffered a grievous injury. So there has been a detestable sedition that we're going to be reading all about in St. Clement's letter. This sedition in the letter of St. Um, Clement to the Corinthians is compared to um, the numerous seditions that took place throughout the Old Testament. Uh, foremost amongst them, Cain and Abel, the sedition of uh, Cain against the law of God, Esau and Jacob, Joseph, Dathan, and Abiram, who rebelled against Moses, and uh, Saul, who rebelled against the law of God as well. Not good company for the rebellious Corinthians. How does St. Clement of Rome's life end? Okay, so uh, the Acts of the Martyrs, which is a 4th century document, describes the martyrdom of St. Clement. Uh, in this account, Trajan sentenced him to work in the mines of a stone quarry, which is basically a death sentence. They would work those slaves to, uh, to the bone and, and to the death. So um, Clement is sentenced to the work in the quarries, um, where he worked a miracle to provide water for all the prisoners by smacking a stone. And when he did so, a vision of a lamb appeared. After this miracle, many prisoners and local pagans, not just prisoners, but people living in the area, um, converted. And so he was sentenced to a more direct execution. He was taken onto a ship. An anchor was tied around his neck. He was cast off of the ship into the Black Sea. This is why St. Clement is the patron saint of mariners. Okay, so what can we say about the Church of Rome underneath the rule of St. Clement in the years 88 through 99 AD? We don't know for certain, but the Church of Rome very well may have been a Greek-speaking church since this was the lingua franca of the underclass immigrant population of Rome. And um, it's estimated that uh, the church during the first century in Rome would have been mostly uh, lower class um, Romans. Uh, or not, we don't know for sure. It's very possible that they spoke Latin. It's very possible that there were um, high profile conversions. And um, most of the acts of martyrdoms of most of the apostles involved converting high profile women and so um, they would have spoken Latin. In fact, the, the uh, martyrdom of St. Peter describes him converting many of the concubines of the imperial household. And so that those concubines would have most likely spoken Latin. Okay. Um, however, the texts of the New Testament were written in Greek. That's kind of why the assumption is that the church at that time was universally speaking Greek, or at least knew Greek. And so they might have used Greek as a more um, useful language to communicate with each other during liturgies. The church had a very strong Jewish foundation. There were a reasonable number of Jews in Rome in the first century. And so um, the practices of the Church of Rome in the first century would have been very inspired by the practices of the synagogue. The Church of Rome was influenced by the Judaizer heresy, which you can learn all about in Book 1, The Reign of the Apostles. Basically, people who were uh, believed in the heretical idea that salvation required a submission to the Mosaic ceremonial law even though Jesus had um, uh, the, the ceremonial law of Moses was cast aside, the moral law remained that Moses revealed, um, but the ceremonial law was cast aside. So the heresy of the Judaizers believed that the ceremonial law was still essential for salvation. Um, St. Paul addresses that heresy directly in his letter to the Romans. 
um, when he contrasts salvation by faith rather than salvation by works of the law. Works of the law meaning the ceremonial aspects of the law, which were not salvific, uh, and faith is salvific. Faith opens our hearts to the saving work of God. Pagans in who had converted into the Church of Rome uh, brought with them Roman piety, which was known universally for its austerity and its precision, and uh, those two features would come to characterize the Church of Rome for centuries and even millennia to come, austerity and precision in uh, belief and precision in prayer formulas and austerity in, in practice and in um, sacrifice. There was success converting some upper-class senators. We alluded to that a minute ago. Flavia, the daughter of a Roman senator, uh, converted during this period, and so did the concubines of Caesar's house uh, to the preaching of St. Peter. Devotion to the apostles Peter, Paul, and all the martyrs were an essential feature to the piety of the Roman church when basilicas were built in the 4th century, and uh, basically Constantine gave the Christians of the city of Rome enormous funds to build basilicas. Um, they chose, of course, to build their basilicas over the remains or the sites of martyrdom of Peter, Paul, and many other martyrs because they continued celebrating Mass in those locations ever since those um, martyrs and saints had died. This shows the devotion that the Church of Rome um, had as an unbroken heritage back to the first century for venerating, um, venerating the tombs and the lives of the martyrs. Here we have images of uh, the tomb of St. Peter. So it was discovered, as I mentioned, that underneath today's St. Peter's Basilica, um, it was discovered in the 20th century that it does stand over an ancient tomb of a man whose um, epitaph very simply identifies him as Peter. So the only way that in the 4th century that church would have been built in the correct location is if Christians in the 1st century continued to celebrate Mass at the location and venerate um, the tomb of Peter. Oh, and then also on this video um, slider, you can see an early Christian mosaic from the early 2nd century. This shows the religious art of the Church of Rome during St. Clement's time, assuming not many changes have taken place since Clement's time and the 2nd century. Key features of the life of Christians in the Church of Rome during St. Clement's papacy um, would have been as we read in the Acts of the Apostles, that there was this primacy towards preaching and explaining the faith, which had not yet been um, delivered to the nations. So that's still going to be an important element of Clement's ministry is preaching and uh, expounding on the Word of God. And the sacramental life is also essential, just as it was in the uh, New Testament as well. Baptism is the high point of every Christian's life, and it still would have been during the reign of St. Clement. And the breaking of the bread, which the Christians had devoted themselves to in the Acts of the Apostles, that still would have been an essential part of the lives of Christians as well. Um, we can see on the right here a mural from the city of Rome called the Fractio Panis, the breaking of the bread. And this shows, um, this this was in a um, uh, catacomb. So above the deceased bodies of Christians, there was the desire to put the image of the sacrament that, that gave them spiritual life and nourishment throughout their lives. And uh, so essential were these two sacraments that even heretical even quasi-pagan sects such as the Gnostics, they practiced um, these deformed forms of uh, baptism and Eucharist in their heretical quasi-pagan sects. Uh, basically, Gnosticism is like a, a dark shadow of Catholicism and um, in the second century. And you'll learn about that in a later chapter titled um, The Second Century Heresies. Uh, but... Um, that this, but the fact that Gnosticism retained baptism and uh, Eucharist in their own deformed way shows how important these sacraments were to the Christians of St. Clement's time. Clement's papacy also coincided with the reign of the wicked Domitian. Domitian was the Roman emperor from 81 to 96 AD. Domitian's reign attempted to execute John the Evangelist in a cauldron of boiling oil in 89 AD. And uh, his reign also oversaw the crucifixion of St. Simon, the second bishop of Jerusalem, the cousin of Jesus, and son of Mary and Cleophas, between 80 and 85 AD, as well as the execution of St. Jude the Apostle, the other brother of the Lord, or cousin of the Lord, during the same time period. 
A Christian daughter of a Roman senator named Flavia was also exiled to Patmos during this period. I mentioned her earlier as a high-profile conversion during this time period. We know she was converted because of the sentence of exile. And uh, like we said at the beginning of St. Clement's letter, he references the persecution that Domitian had, under, uh, had, had undertaken as a successive calamitous events uh, that had uh, plagued the Church of Rome for about six years. Let's look a little bit about the city of Corinth to which St. Clement was addressing his letter to better understand the context in which he was writing. Corinth is located between the Achaean and uh, the rest of the Greek peninsula. So I'm going to, if you look at the video here, you can see on this narrow isthmus connecting the Achaean Peninsula where Sparta is located and then the rest of the mainland Greek Peninsula, you can see uh, Corinth. So Corinth is in a very advantageous position um, for trade because it connects um, the Aegean and uh, this sea here. It was the provincial capital of southern Greece during the first century Roman Empire. As a result of that and its favorable location, Corinth became a commercial hub. And because of all the wealth that was flowing into the city of Corinth, it began to become a city, a sort of capital of vice in the Roman Empire. Live like a Corinthian was a popular party culture slogan in the first century. And you can imagine it had similar activities that you would imagine at a Las Vegas which you could easily imagine somebody in American culture today saying, live like a Las Vegian. It doesn't have a very good ring to it. Corinth would have had a similar reputation in the first century. Pagans, we have archaeological evidence that pagans living in Corinth enjoyed sacred prostitution rituals. So in that environment, in Acts chapter 18, St. Paul formed the Corinthian church. Imagine... Now, everything you know about St. Paul establishing the Church of Corinth, imagine him establishing it in a, a moral cesspool like Las Vegas. We can read a little bit about that um, in Acts chapter 18. After these things, departing from Athens, St. Paul came to Corinth, and finding a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, with Priscilla his wife, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, he came to them. And because he was of the same trade, he remained with them and wrought. Now they are tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, bringing in the name of the Lord Jesus. And he persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia, Paul was earnest in preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. So you can see the tactic St. Paul used by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Um, he went into the synagogues of Corinth, where there already were people trying to live holy lives. And and he started by converting them to the name of our Lord Jesus. And then from that strong nucleus would spread a holy church in Corinth. And this is uh, continuing the story. The Jews began to gainsay and blaspheme him and shake his garment. I'm sorry, excuse me. So St. Paul. So, um, but they gainsaying and blaspheming. So the Jews were gainsaying and blaspheming against St. Paul, and he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go to the Gentiles. And departing thence, he entered into the house of a certain man named Titus Eustus, one that worshipped God, whose house was adjoining the synagogue. And Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not fear, but speak, and hold not thy peace, because I am with thee, and no man shall set upon thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in the city. So God affirms to St. Paul that he has much people in the city, as immoral as it might have seemed. And St. Paul is able to reap very much fruit there. He stayed there a year and six months, teaching among them the word of God. And so uh, St. Paul, in around the year 57 AD now, he's going to write his first letter to the Corinthians. And St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians overviews a wide assortment of issues. Okay, so uh, on the one hand, he asserts, he addresses factions uh, in Corinth, where some Corinthians are identifying with different apostles as the one they identify most with. Um, 
they perceive the apostles in the similar way that Greeks perceived philosophical schools. So like some people say they were Platonists or a Pythagorean or um, followers of Aristotle. And they were, they were thinking that's how you act as a Christian. And St. Paul had to correct that and, and for no, we're not each establishing a philosophical school. We are all teaching the same truth, even if uh, in slightly different language. He continued on that theme later in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 when he explains uh, there was a misunderstanding. The faith was being perceived as a school of human wisdom as opposed to a saving bark to bring us to everlasting life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, St. Paul addressed the issue of sexual immorality, fornication, and incest. In 1 Corinthians 6, he addressed the issue of certain Christians in the Church of Corinth um, bringing about lawsuits to one another. In 1 Corinthians uh, 6, he addressed um, the horrors of sacred prostitution. He said, Know you not that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? God forbid. Or know you not that he who adheres to a harlot is made one body with her? For they shall be, saith he, two in one flesh. But he who adheres to the Lord is one spirit. Why fornication? It seems appalling that St. Paul had to explain that why prostitution, probably sacred prostitution, is immoral, but it seems that this was an issue that he had to address. In 1 Corinthians um, chapter 7, he addressed that uh, virginity is a more glorious vocation than marriage, though he did not forbid marriage, and in fact he said marriage is uh, advantageous uh, for many people if that is what their calling is, if they're not called to virginity. Um, I'm reading into it a little bit, of course, with the light of how church tradition has developed that verse. In the verse itself, St. Paul just said it's better to be married than to burn with lust. Chapters, uh, and then point number seven, he addressed the issue of uh, eating meats which were offered to idols. He said, you cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. He also talked about the need for wives to be subordinate to their husbands, which hopefully we don't feel the need to explain away, but we can just accept with humility. He uh, described the issue of agape meal abuses in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 20, in which there was divisions based on social status between the different Christians at the agape meals, which were kind of like um, fellowship meals between the Christians of that church. He talked about the spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. And he talked about the primacy of love being the greatest of all gifts, far greater than any particular charisms. He also addressed the Eucharist, saying, The chalice of benediction which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? And the blood, bread which we break, is it not the partaking of the body of the Lord? For we being many are one bread, one body, all that partake of one bread. Behold Israel according to the flesh. Are not they that eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? You cannot drink the chalice of the Lord and the chalice of devils. You cannot be partakers of the table of the Lord and the table of the devils. So St. Paul is telling us that the chalice is a communion in the blood of Christ and the bread a partaking of the body of the Lord just like the Jews had to eat the sacrifices they offered to become one with those sacrifices, we must eat the sacrifice that Jesus offered to become, with that, to become one with that sacrifice. Around the year 57 AD, St. Paul addressed the Corinthian super apostles, which is another word for Judaizers. Paul defended his authority over the church of Corinth over the Judaizer heretical missionaries in that same letter. Addressing Judaizers in St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. Now, the Church of Corinth, to their credit, despite all their issues that St. Paul had to address, humbly celebrated their public rebukes and they grew in faith and number throughout the first century as a result of this humility, which allowed their soil to be fertile for God to do great work. Similar issues that St. Paul addressed would crop up again in the late first century philosophical open mindedness to a fault, factions, an egalitarian inspired rebelliousness, just like Korah. Um, you know, Korah brought about an egalitarian inspired rebelliousness in uh, the Exodus story because he said, um, Aren't we all the people of the Lord? Why should Moses and Aaron and Miriam stand over us? 
so uh, that same sort of egalitarian minded rebelliousness uh, would crop up in the Church of Corinth in the late first century, which is the inspiration for St. Clement's letter to the Corinthians. So, whoops. Um, excuse me. St. Clement's letter to the Corinthians uh, is found in the Codex Herio Soli Militanus of 1056. So it's found in a, a scroll written in 1056. It was discovered in 1873. That's how we have this marvelous document today. The document was written around the year 96 AD, and the document is uh, astounding 65 chapters. Now these chapters are each only a couple paragraphs long but it, it would rival the length of uh, a long epistle in the New Testament. I would encourage you to read the entire document, but for the rest of this video, we're gonna be taking excerpts from each chapter, each of the 65 chapters, so that we can get a good sense of the main ideas that St. Clement was addressing to the Church of Corinth. And so we begin, chapter one. So for the rest of the video, I'll just be reading the letters of St. Clement, and after I read uh, some excerpts from each chapter, I'll maybe we'll offer a little bit of thoughts, but mostly I'll let St. Clement do the talking. Owing, dear brethren, to the sudden and successive calamitous events which have happened to ourselves, we feel that we have been somewhat tardy in turning our attention to the points respecting which you consulted us, especially to that shameful and detestable sedition, utterly abhorrent to the elect of God, which a few rash and self-confident persons have kindled to such a pitch of frenzy that your venerable and illustrious name, worthy to be universally loved, has suffered grievous injury. For you did all things without respect of persons, and walked in the commandments of God, being obedient to those who had the rule over you, and giving all fitting honor to the presbyters among you. So St. Clement is talking about how they, in this final paragraph here, about how the Corinthians had responded with humility to St. Paul's first and second letters in the 50s. And so this is 40 years later. And over the course of those 40 years, um, the, the Corinthians had been very holy. They walked without respect of persons, so they didn't treat rich people different from poor people. They walked in the commandments of God, which St. Paul addressed many of, and um, they were obedient to their presbyters. They were not disobedient to the lawful authorities of the church. Chapter 2. Content with the provision which God had made for you, and carefully attending to his words, you were inwardly filled with his doctrine, and his sufferings were always before your eyes. Thus a profound and abundant peace was given to you all, and you had an unsatiable desire for doing good, while the full outpouring of the Holy Spirit was upon you all. You were sincere and uncorrupted, and forgetful of injuries between one another. Every kind of faction and schism was abominable in your sight. So this chapter here is praising the Corinthians for the virtues they've shown for these last 40 years. And St. Clement says they had a profound and abundant peace in the Church of Corinth because they attended to God's words, they were filled with his doctrine, and his suffering was always before their eyes. They were sincere and uncorrupted, they forgave one another, and they found all factions and schisms of Abominable. Better that we are unified in the name of Christ. Chapter 3. St. Clement talks about the seditions in Corinth. Then was fulfilled that which is written, My beloved ate and drank, and was enlarged, and became fat, and kicked. This is from Deuteronomy 32, verse 15. Hence flowed emulation and envy, strife and sedition, persecution and disorder, war and captivity. So the worthless rose up against the honored, those of no reputation against those as were renowned, the foolish against the wise, the young against those advanced in years. For this reason, righteousness and peace are now far departed from you. So this verse he references here, that my beloved, which is a way of referring to the church, when God refers to the church, ate and drank and was enlarged and became fat and kicked. Hopefully that those words never describe us as Christians or us collectively as a local church or the universal church, that we eat and drink, we're enlarged and become fat and kicked. Hopefully we're not content becoming lukewarm and just enjoying how pretty we think we look in the mirror, because out of that sort of attitude flows emulation, envy, strife, sedition, persecution, disorder, war, and captivity. It says here, uh, the foolish rose up against the wise, the worthless rose up against the honored, the young against the elders. 
And um, whenever that's happening, it's, it's not going to lay good seeds for the church. And uh, we're emerging out of a period where that was um, the attitude in the um, 60s and 70s. The, the prevailing attitude in the church was of rebelliousness against the honored elders of the church with the young generation of Catholics in that time, um, clerical and lay. So um, this is no wonder that we have um, that righteousness and peace are far from us as a church today. We're, we're eating the sour grapes that were planted in the 60s and 70s, and um, there's, there's no easy way to mince words with what tragedies happened morally in the 60s and 70s that, that we're still experiencing the effects of. So what's the solution? Let's keep reading. Envy and jealousy led to the murder of a brother. And oh, this chapter is St. Clement's referring to how the same source that is plaguing the Corinthians, envy, which causes rebelliousness, um, that envy has led to many evils already throughout the history of salvation. So St. Clement writes, Envy and jealousy led to the murder of a brother, Cain. Through envy also, our father Jacob fled from the face of Esau, his brother. Envy made Joseph be persecuted unto death and to come into bondage. Envy compelled Moses to flee from the face of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, when he heard these words from his fellow countrymen. Who made you a judge and ruler over us? Will you kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? On account of envy, Aaron and Miriam had to make their abode without the camp. Envy brought down Dathan and Abiram alive into Hades through the sedition which they excited against God's servant Moses. Through envy, David not only underwent the hatred of foreigners, but was also persecuted by Saul, king of Israel. Peter, through unrighteous envy, endured not one or two, but numerous labors, departed to the place of glory due to him. Owing to envy, Paul also obtained the reward of patient endurance after being seven times thrown into captivity, compelled to flee, and stoned. So St. Clement goes from David all the way to St. Peter and Paul, describing the deaths of the illustrious Glorious Apostle St. Peter and Paul as a result of envy of the Roman governors. Through envy, those women, the Danaids and the Durkae, being persecuted after they had suffered terrible and unspeakable torments, finished the course of their faith with steadfastness, and though weak in body, received a noble reward. Envy has alienated wives from their husbands and changed that saying of our father Adam, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. So, Envy and strife have overthrown great cities and rooted up mighty nations. So he's saying that it's envy that causes many wives to leave their husbands, which is changing the saying of Adam, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Chapter 7. We are struggling on the same arena, and the same conflict is assigned to both of us. Wherefore, let us give up vain and fruitless cares and approach to the glorious and venerable rule of our holy calling. Let us attend to what is good, pleasing, and acceptable in the sight of him who formed us. Let us look steadfastly to the blood of Christ and see how precious that blood is to God, which, having been shed for our salvation, has set the grace of repentance before the whole world. The Lord has granted a place of repentance to all such as would be converted unto him, Noah preached repentance, and as many as listened to him were saved. Chapter 8 Adding moreover this gracious Ezekiel, adding moreover this gracious declaration, Repent, O house of Israel, of your iniquity. Say to the children of my people, Though your sins reach from earth to heaven, and though they be redder than scarlet, and blacker than sackcloth, yet if you turn to me with your whole heart and say, Father, I will listen to you as to a holy people, and in another place he speaks thus, Wash you and become clean. Put away the wickedness of your souls from before my eyes. Cease from your evil ways and learn to do well. Chapter 9 Let us yield obedience to his most excellent and glorious will, and imploring his mercy and loving kindness, while we forsake all fruitless labors and strifes and envy, which leads to death, let us turn and have recourse to his compassions. It's there's so much, it's so easy to say, you know, the basic message of St. John the Baptist, uh, repent, and believe in the gospel. You could say it in a word, but you can also say it in four chapters like St. Clement does here. And it's just so beautiful when you think about um, the awesomeness of repentance, that God always leaves that door open to us. 
and uh, how sad it is that sometimes we are so lethargic to enter through it when all we have to do is enter in through that door, uh, fall on our knees, and, and say, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Chapter 10. Abraham, styled the friend, was found faithful in as much as he rendered obedience to the words of God. So let's see St. Clement talk a little bit about the importance of obedience, which the people of Corinth, some of them are lacking. On account of his hospitality and godliness, Lot was saved out of Sodom when all the country round was punished by means of fire and brimstone, the Lord thus making it manifest that he does not forsake those that hope in him, but gives up such as depart from him to punishment and torture. <clears throat> On account of her faith and hospitality, Rahab the harlot was saved. Moreover, they gave her a sign to this effect that she should hang forth from her house a scarlet thread. And thus they made it manifest that redemption should flow through the blood of the Lord to all them that believe and hope in God. Because that scarlet thread looked like a flow of blood. It was a uh, typology, it was a type or a foreshadowing of the saving flow from the Lord's wounds, which we now have access to. So he's telling the Corinthian church to, to take access of the flowing blood of Christ and stop sinning and start repenting and, and restore your your salvation. Let us therefore, brethren, be of humble mind, laying aside all haughtiness and pride and foolishness and angry feelings. Let us act according to that which is written, for the Holy Spirit says, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty glory in his might. Um, neither let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glories glory in the Lord, in diligently seeking him and doing judgment and righteousness being especially mindful of the words of the Lord Jesus, which he spoke, teaching us meekness and long-suffering. Chapter 14. We should obey God rather than the authors of the sedition in Corinth. It is right and holy, therefore, men and brethren, rather to obey God than to follow those who, through pride and sedition, have become the leaders of a detestable emulation. For we shall incur no slight injury, but rather great danger, if we rashly yield ourselves to the inclinations of men who aim at exciting strife and tumults, so as to draw us away from what is good. Chapter 15. Let us cleave, therefore, to those who cultivate peace with godliness, and not to those who, cult, who hypocritically profess to desire it. So saying you want the peace of God is nothing. Doing the things God clearly revealed give us peace especially obedience and humility, um, that means everything. Follow the people who actually want peace, not the people who say they do. For Now Christ is the example of humility we must all follow that teaches us how to have peace. Chapter 16. For Christ is of those who are humble-minded and not of those who exalt themselves over his flock. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the scepter of the majesty of God, did not come in the pomp of pride or arrogance although he might have done so, but in a lowly condition, as the Holy Spirit had declared regarding him. You see, beloved, what is the example which has been given us? For if the Lord thus humbled himself, what shall we do who have through him come under the yoke of his grace? Let us be imitators also of those who, in goatskins and sheepskins, went about proclaiming the coming of Christ. I mean Elijah, Elisha, and Ezekiel, among the prophets with those others to whom a like testimony is born. Abraham was specially honored and was called the friend of God. Yet he, earnestly, regarding the glory of God, humbly declared, I am but dust and ashes. So the true prophets are humble, wearing sackcloth, goatskins, sheepskins. And the false prophets glorify themselves and not God. Chapter 18 on David. But what shall we say concerning David, to whom such testimony was born, and of whom God said, I have found a man after my own heart, David the son of Jesse, and in everlasting mercy have anointed him. Yet this very man says to God, Have mercy on me, O Lord, according to your great mercy, and according to the multitude of your compassions blot out my transgressions. Wash me still more from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge mine iniquity, and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done which is evil in your sight. So St. Clement's referencing Psalm 50, written by David, 
repenting of his sins. He wasn't too prideful to repent, even though God had anointed him and, and set him up as the king of the people. Just want to draw attention to the way that St. Clement is making his point by using scripture, because he is still, you know, a student of the school of the apostles. Think about the sermons of, of Peter. Think about the, the teachings of Stephen on the day he was martyred. And think about how they just would, they would just go through the whole salvation history to teach about the glory of Christ's salvation. That's how Clement still teaches. And he's using all of salvation history to make his point about the need to be obedient and humble. Chapter 19. Having so many great and glorious examples set before us, let us turn again to the practice of that peace, which from the beginning was the mark set before us. And let us look steadfastly to the Father and Creator of the universe, and cleave to his mighty and surpassingly great gifts and benefactions of peace. Let us contemplate him with our understanding, and look with the eyes of our soul to his long-suffering will. Chapter 20. So here St. Clement talks about how the very stars and galaxies and all the uh, laws of the universe teach us to be obedient to God. The heavens revolving under his government are subject to him in peace. Day and night run the course appointed by him in no wise hindering each other. The sun and moon with the company of the stars roll on in harmony according to his command within their prescribed limits and without any deviation. The fruitful earth according to his will brings forth food in abundance at the proper seasons. For man and beast and all the living beings upon it, never hesitating, nor changing any of the ordinances which he has fixed. Chapter 21. Take heed, beloved, lest his many kindnesses lead to the condemnation of us all. It is right, therefore, that we should not leave the post which his will has assigned us. Let us rather offend those men who are foolish and inconsiderate and lifted up, and who glory in the pride of their speech, than offend God. Far better to offend sinners than to offend God trying to please sinners. 22. Now the faith which is in Christ confirms all these admonitions, for he himself by the Holy Ghost thus addresses us, Come ye children, and hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is he that desires life and loves to see good days? Keep your tongue from evil, and your lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. 23. Far from us be that which is written, Wretched are they who are of a double mind and of a double doubting heart, who say, These things we have heard even in the times of our fathers. But behold, we have grown old, and none of them have happened unto us. You foolish ones, compare yourselves to a tree. Take, for instance, the vine. First of all, it sheds its leaves, and then it buds, next it puts forth leaves, and then it flowers. After that comes the sour grape, and then follows the ripened fruit. You perceive how in a little time the fruit of a tree comes to maturity. Of a truth, soon and suddenly shall his will be accomplished. As the scripture also bears witness, saying, Speedily will he come, and he will not tarry. And the Lord shall suddenly come to his temple, even the Holy One for whom you look. So St. Clement is saying, Wretched are those Christians who are saying, Our parents told us that Jesus was going to come back soon, but he didn't come back yet. So he's saying, um, He will come back quickly. Speedily will he come. But um, his whole will has to be accomplished first. 24. Let us consider, beloved, how the Lord continually proves to us that there shall be a future resurrection, of which he has rendered the Lord Jesus Christ the first fruits by raising him from the dead. Let us contemplate, beloved, the resurrection which is at all times taking place. Day and night declare to us a resurrection. Let us behold the fruits of the earth, how the sowing of grain takes place. So now St. Clement is proving that there will be a resurrection of the dead. Um, presumably to make his point about the need to fear the judgment of God in being rebellious. But he's going to look at, um, all throughout the universe, these different symbols of the resurrection that God has given us. And the famous chapter of this letter is the chapter on the phoenix. It's unclear if St. Clement actually believed in the phoenix. He seems like he actually did believe that phoenixes were real, as he had heard of them. Um, which this could be one of the deciding factors that made this not scriptural. Many first century Christians believed this was a scriptural letter, divinely inspired. Um, the church ended up deciding it was not. Ultimately, um, there are no epistles written by non-apostles. And so that, well, yeah, there are no epistles written by non-apostles. So that's probably the reason it wasn't included as well. But also this fact is 
erroneous. St. Clement refers to a phoenix as though it's a real bird. Um, but he took it as a symbol of the resurrection, which, for all we know, the bird might have been um, imagined up in the minds of the authors of these stories because deeply implanted in their psyche is the word of God, the creator of those people who imagined the story of the phoenix. Let us consider that wonderful sign of the resurrection, which takes place in eastern lands, that is, in Arabia and the countries round about. There is a certain bird which is called a phoenix. This is the only one of its kind and lives 500 years. And when the time of its dissolution draws near that it must die, it builds itself a nest of frankincense and myrrh and other spices, into which, when the time is fulfilled, it enters and dies. But as the flesh decays, a certain kind of worm is produced, which, being nourished by the juices of the dead bird, brings forth feathers. Then, when it has acquired strength, it takes up that nest in which are the bones of its parent, and bearing these, it passes from the land of Arabia into Egypt, the city of Heliopolis. And an open day, flying in the sight of all men, it places them on the altar of the sun, and having done this, hastens back to its former abode. The priests then inspect the registers of the dates and find that it has returned exactly as the 500th year was completed. <clears throat> Do we then deem it any great and wonderful thing that the maker of all things to raise up again those that have piously served him in the assurance of a good faith, when even a, by a bird he shows us the mightiness of his power to fulfill his promise? For the scripture says in a certain place, you shall raise me up, and I shall confess unto thee. And again I laid me down and slept. I awoke because you are with me. And again Job says, You shall raise up this flesh of mine, which has suffered all these things. Chapter 27. Having then this hope, let our souls be bound to him who is faithful to his promises and just in his judgments. 28. Since then all things are seen and heard by God, let us fear him and forsake those wicked works which proceed from evil desires, so that through his mercy we may be protected from the judgments to come. Let us then draw near to him with holiness of spirit, lifting up pure and undefiled hands unto him, loving our gracious and merciful Father, who has made us partakers in the blessings of his elect. Behold, the Lord takes on to himself a nation out of the midst of the nations, as a man takes the first fruits of his threshing floor, and from that nation shall come forth the most holy. Seeing therefore that we are the portion of the Holy One, let us do all those things which pertain to holiness, avoid evil speaking, all abominable and impure embraces, together with all drunkenness, and seeking after change all abominable lusts, detestable adultery, and execrable pride. Let us clothe ourselves with concord and humility, ever exercising self-control, standing far off from all whispering and evil speaking, being justified by our works and not our words. For the scripture says, he that speaks much shall also hear much in answer. And does he that is ready in speech deem himself righteous? Blessed is he that is born of a woman who lives but a short time. Be not given to much speaking. Let our praise be in God and not of ourselves, for God hates those that commend themselves. <clears throat> Let us cleave then to his blessing, and consider what are the means of possessing it. Let us think over the things which have taken place from the beginning. For what reason was our father Abraham blessed? Was it not because he wrought righteousness and truth through faith? Isaac, with perfect confidence, as if knowing what was to happen, cheerfully yielded himself as a sacrifice. <clears throat> I noticed in this previous chapter that um, St. Clement is revealing himself as a student of St. Paul with this big list of vices and, and lists of things to avoid. St. Paul did that very often in his epistles, and it was most likely a, a common element of his preaching. <clears throat> but also, um, it looks like St. Clement is clarifying maybe a misunderstanding that people had from St. Paul's letter to the Romans when St. Paul said that um, Abraham was justified by faith and not works. So then St. Clement says here, for what reason was our father Abraham blessed? Was it not because he wrought righteousness and truth through faith? So St. Clement is um, correcting any misunderstandings there that it was through his faith that he did righteous works. And, and this is why he is blessed. 
We too, being called by his will in Christ Jesus, are not justified by ourselves, nor by our own wisdom or understanding or godliness or works which we have wrought in holiness of heart, but by that faith through which, from the beginning, Almighty God has justified all men, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And he's re-clarifying here the other misunderstanding um, that might have come just from learning about the moral law, that that's how we save ourselves. So here, St. Clement is saying, we are saved through faith. And through that faith, if we use the grace we have been given to serve God, we will remain one with God. If we do not serve God with the grace he's given us, God will say to us on the last day, I never knew you. 33. What shall we do then, brethren? Shall we become slothful and well-doing and cease from the practice of love? God forbid that any such course should be followed by us. But rather let us hasten with all energy and readiness of mind to perform every good work. For the Creator and Lord of all himself rejoices in his works. Even God rejoices in his works, so we should rejoice in doing the work of God with the grace he's given us. We see then how all righteous men have been adorned with good works, and how the Lord himself, adorning himself with his works, rejoiced. Having therefore such an example, let us without delay accede to his will, and let us work the righteousness with our whole strength. The good servant receives the bread of his labor with confidence. The lazy and slothful cannot look his employer in the face. It is requisite, therefore, that we be prompt in the practice of well-doing, for of him are all things. Let us submit ourselves to his will. Let us consider the whole multitude of his angels, how they stand ever ready to minister to his will. How blessed and wonderful, beloved, are the gifts of God, life and immortality, splendor and righteousness, truth and perfect confidence, faith and assurance, self-control and holiness. And all these things fall under the cognizance of our understandings now. What then shall those things be which are prepared for such as wait for him? The things we can't imagine now. But how, beloved, shall this be done? If our understandings be fixed by faith towards God, if we earnestly seek the things which are pleasing and acceptable to him, if we do the things which are in harmony with his blameless will, and if we follow the way of truth, casting away from us all unrighteousness and iniquity, along with all covetousness, strife, evil practices, deceit, whispering, and evil speaking, all hatred of God, pride, and haughtiness, vainglory, and ambition. By him we behold, as in a glass, his immaculate and most excellent visage. By him are the eyes of our hearts opened. By him our foolish and darkened understandings blossoms up anew towards his marvelous light. By him the Lord has willed that we should taste of immortal knowledge. Let us then, men and soldiers, with all energy, act the part of soldiers, in accordance with his holy commandments. Let us consider those who serve under our generals, with what order, obedience, and submissiveness they perform the things which are commanded them. All are not prefects, nor commanders of a thousand, nor of a hundred, nor of fifty, nor the like, but each one in his rank performs the things commanded by the king and generals. He's using the analogy of a military to help us understand our role in the church, that we all have a role. Not all are prefects, commanders, or generals, but we all have a role to play in advancing God's cause. 38. Let our whole body then be preserved in Christ Jesus, and let everyone be subject to his neighbor according to the special gift bestowed upon him. Let the wise man display his wisdom, not by mere words, but through good deeds. Let the humble not bear testimony to himself, but leave witness to be borne to him by another. Let him that is pure in the flesh not grow proud of it and boast, knowing that it was another who bestowed on him the gift of continence. Let us consider then, brethren, of what matter we were made, who and what manner of beings we came into the world, as it were out of a sepulchre and from utter darkness. So without God, we emerged into this world out of utter darkness, out of a depraved human flesh that has fallen. So anything good we have is from the special grace of God. Foolish and inconsiderate men, who have neither wisdom nor instruction, mock and deride us, being eager to exalt themselves in their own conceits. The heaven is not clean in God's sight, how much less they that dwell in the houses of clay, of which also we ourselves were made. He smote them as a moth, and from morning even until evening they endure not. Because they could furnish no assistance to themselves, they perished. 
He breathed upon them, and they died, because they had no wisdom. But call now, if anyone will answer you, or if you will look to any of the holy angels. For wrath destroys the foolish man, and envy kills him that is in error. He has enjoined offerings to be presented, and service to be performed to him, and that not thoughtlessly or regularly, but at the appointed times and hours. Where and by whom he desires these things to be done, he himself is fixed by his own supreme will, in order that all things, being piously done according to his good pleasure, may be acceptable to him. Those, therefore, who present their offerings at the appointed times are accepted and blessed, for inasmuch as they follow the laws of the Lord, they sin not. For his own peculiar services are assigned to the high priests, and their own proper place is prescribed to the priests, and their own special ministrations devolve on the Levites. The layman is bound by laws that pertain to laymen. He's saying in the Old Testament there were different laws given about um, the sacrifices that were offered at the temple at different hours and which class of priests was to offer which offering. And he's using that as an analogy to tell us basically today, especially the Church of Corinth in his day, know your place and do the offering that God asks you to offer. For example, go to Mass for us today um, on Holy Days of Obligation. Perform the fasts prescribed by the Church, the abstinences prescribed by the Church. Today is a Friday. Are you doing any sort of penance? You have to do some sort of penance on a Friday. For example, but he's also saying, know your place. Um, if you're not a priest, don't presume to have the authority of a priest. 41. Let every one of you, brethren, give thanks to God in his own order, living in all good conscience, with becoming gravity, and not going beyond the rule of ministry prescribed to him. Not in every place, brethren, are the daily sacrifices offered, or the peace offerings, or the sin offering, and the trespass offering, but in Jerusalem only. And even there they are not offered in any place, but only at the altar before the temple, that which is offered being carefully first examined by the high priest and the ministers already mentioned. Those, therefore, who do anything beyond that which is agreeable to his will were punished with death. Foreshadowing, spiritual death. By not doing, uh, by not participating in the church in the way God has ordered your class to participate, whether it be lay, priest, deacon, or bishop. Having therefore received their orders, and being fully assured by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, and established in the word of God, with full assurance of the Holy Ghost, the apostles went forth proclaiming that the kingdom of God was at hand, and thus preaching through countries and cities, they appointed the first fruits of their labors, having first proved them by the Spirit to be bishops and deacons of those who should serve afterwards, and believe. Nor was this any new thing, since indeed many ages before it was written concerning bishops and deacons. For thus says the scripture in a certain place, I will appoint their bishops in righteousness and their deacons in faith. And what wonder is it if those in Christ who were entrusted with such a duty by God appointed those ministers before mentioned when the blessed Moses also, a faithful servant in all his house, noted down in the sacred books all the injunctions which were given him and, with, and when the other prophets also followed him, bearing witness with one consent to the ordinances which he had appointed. For when rivalry arose concerning the priesthood, and the tribes were contending among themselves as to which of them should be adorned with that glorious title, he commanded the twelve princes of the tribes to bring with them their rods, each one being inscribed with the name of the tribe. And he took them and bound them together, and he sealed them with the rings of the princes of the tribes, and laid them up in the tabernacle of witness on the table of God. He said to them, Men and brethren, the tribe whose rod shall blossom, has God chosen to fulfill the office of the priesthood to minister unto him. So he's showing that God has named the priests, and we cannot take that honor upon ourselves, like the rebellious Corinthians were. Our apostles also knew through our Lord Jesus Christ that there would be strife on account of the office of the episcopate. For this reason, therefore, inasmuch as they had obtained a perfect foreknowledge of this, they appointed those ministers already mentioned, and afterwards gave instructions that when these should fall asleep, other approved men should succeed them in their ministry. This is a key um, thing to focus on here. St. Clement is saying that the apostles laid out the plan to choose new bishops to replace them, and they even chose their first successors so there wouldn't be um, schisms over that decision. Um, St. Clement knew the apostles personally, so this is very authoritative that this is how the office of the episcopate began. Um, liberal uh, historians assert that um, in the early church that was kind of democratic, but um, or there was a group of bishops kind of ruling over a church equally, like an oligarchy. But here Clement is explaining that the apostles set up a system in which bishops would replace them to rule the churches that they set up. 
We are of the opinion, therefore, that those who are appointed by them or afterwards by other eminent men with the consent of the whole church and who have blamelessly served the flock of Christ in a humble, peaceable, and disinterested spirit, and have for a long time possessed the good opinion of all, cannot be justly dismissed from the ministry. So he's saying that you can't just have a rebellion and dismiss your bishop, lay people. That's what some Corinthians were trying to do. 45. It is, you are of fond contention, brethren, and full of zeal about those things which do not pertain to salvation. Look carefully into the scriptures, which are the true utterances of the Holy Spirit. Observe that nothing in of an unjust or counterfeit character is written in them. There you will not find that the righteous were cast off by men who themselves were holy. The righteous were indeed persecuted, but only ever by the wicked. Let us cleave, therefore, to the innocent and righteous, since these are the elect of God. Why are there strifes, tumults, divisions, schisms, and wars among you? Have we not all one God and one Christ? Is there not one spirit of grace poured out upon us? And have we not one calling in Christ? Your schism has subverted the faith of many. Many has discouraged many, has given rise to doubt in many, and has caused grief to us all. And still your sedition continues. It is disgraceful, beloved. Highly disgraceful, yes. And we're unworthy of your Christian profession that such a thing should be heard of as that the most steadfast and ancient church of the Corinthians should, on account of one or two persons, engage in sedition against its presbyters. Let us therefore with all haste put an end to this state of things, and let us fall down before the Lord, and beseech him with tears, that he would mercifully be reconciled to us, and restore us to our formal seemly and holy practice of brotherly love. Let us therefore with all haste put an end to this state of things, and let us fall down before the Lord, and beseech him with tears that he would mercifully be reconciled to us and restore us to our firm, former seemly and holy practice of brotherly love. Who could describe the blessed bond of the love of God? What man is able to tell the excellence of its beauty? As it ought to be told, the height to which love exalts is unspeakable. Love unites us to God. Love covers a multitude of sins. Love bears all things, is long-suffering in all things. There is nothing base, nothing arrogant in love. Love admits of no schisms. Love gives rise to no seditions. Love does all things in harmony. Let us pray, therefore, and implore of his mercy that we may live blameless in love, free from all human partialities for one above another. All the generations from Adam even unto this day have passed away, but those who, through the grace of God, have been made perfect in love now possess a place among the godly and shall be made manifest at the revelation of the kingdom of Christ. Let us therefore implore the forgiveness for all those transgressions which through any suggestion of the adversary we have committed, and those who have been the leaders of sedition and disagreement ought to have respect to the common hope. For such as live in fear and love would rather that they themselves than their neighbors should be involved in suffering. The Lord, brethren, stands in need of nothing, and he desires nothing of anyone except that confession be made. The servant speaks freely to his Lord and asks forgiveness for the people or begs that he himself might perish along with them. So now he's telling the leaders of Corinth to beg forgiveness on behalf of the rebellious Corinthian church. Who then among you is noble-minded? Who compassionate? Who full of love? Let him declare if on account of sedition, if on my account sedition and disagreement and schisms have arisen, I will depart. I will go away wherever you desire and I will do whatever the majority commands. Only let the flock of Christ live on terms of peace with the presbyters set over us. So if a holy man, if a sedition caused because of a holy man, even if a holy man didn't want it, he should be willing to leave to fix the sedition. That's how much he should hate sedition. Many kings and princes in times of pestilence, when they had been instructed by an oracle, have given themselves up to death in order that their own, by their own blood they might deliver their fellow citizens from destruction. Many have gone forth from their own cities, that so sedition might be brought to an end within them. We know many among ourselves who have given themselves up to bonds in order that they might ransom others. Many, too, have surrendered themselves to slavery, that with the price which they receive for themselves, they might provide food for others. That's an amazing detail about the Church of Rome, that he knew many um, who had given themselves up to um, enslavement to free others from enslavement or to provide food for, for others. What a great way to protest the system of slavery, but do it in a personal way by becoming a slave to free a slave. Let us then also pray for those who have fallen into any sin, that meekness and humility may not be given to them, so that they may submit, not unto us, but to the will of God. 
So let's be harsh with sinners to help them learn to submit. Let us receive correction, beloved, on account of which no one should feel displeased. Those exhortations by which we admonish one another are both good in themselves and highly profitable, for they tend to unite us to the will of God. For thus says the Holy Word, The Lord has severely chastened me, and he has not given me over to death. You, therefore, who laid the foundations of this sedition, submit yourselves to the presbyters and receive correction so as to repent, bending the knees of your hearts. Learn to be subject, laying aside the proud and arrogant self-confidence of your tongue. For it is better for you that you should occupy a humble but honorable place in the flock of Christ than that, being highly exalted, you should be cast out from the hope of his people. Let us, therefore, flee from the warning threats pronounced by wisdom on the disobedient and yield submission to his all-holy and glorious name, that we may stay our trust upon the most hallowed name of his majesty. If, however, any shall disobey the words spoken by him through us, let them know that they will involve themselves in transgression and serious danger. But we shall be innocent of this sin, and instant in prayer and supplication shall desire that the creator of all perverse, unbroken, the creator of all, preserve unbroken the computed number of his elect in the whole world through his beloved son, Jesus Christ, through whom he called us from darkness to light and from ignorance to knowledge of the glory of his name, our hope resting on your name, which is the primal cause of every creature. And chapters 59 through 61 are the great prayer um, that finishes St. Clement's letter. Some suggest this great prayer might have been a part of the Eucharistic liturgy of Rome during the first century. Others would contend no St. Peter himself had handed down the Roman canon. In my opinion, this prayer does not seem like a Eucharistic anaphora. I wouldn't doubt, though, that if this was a period in which uh, improvisational anaphoras was permitted in the Church of Rome, that um, this prayer is going to use similar language to common Eucharistic prayers, but it doesn't seem like it's a, um, a Eucharistic prayer. It doesn't have the essential elements of Eucharistic prayers throughout the different liturgies of the Church. Regardless, it is a great prayer, as it is titled. So let's read the prayer in totality. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our hope rests on your name, which is the primal cause of every creature. Having opened the eyes of our heart to the knowledge of you, who alone rests highest among the highest, holy among the holy, who layest low the insolence of the haughty, who destroyest the calculations of the heathen, who settest the low and high, and bringest low the exalted, who makest rich and makest poor, who killest and makest to live, only benefactor of spirits and God of all flesh, who beholdest the depths, the eyewitness of human works, the help of those in danger, the savior of those in despair, the creator and guardian of every spirit, who multipliest nations upon earth, and from all made choice of those who love you through Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, through whom you instructed, sanctify, and honor us. We would have you, Lord, to prove our help and succor, those of us in affliction save, on the lowly take pity. The fallen raise, upon those in need arise. The sick heal, the wandering ones of your people turn. Fill the hungry, redeem those of us in bonds. Raise up those that are weak, comfort the faint-hearted. Let all the nations know that you are God alone, and Jesus Christ your Son. And we are your people and the sheep of your pasture. You made to appear the, undearing fab the enduring fabric of the world by the works of your hands. You, Lord, created the earth on which we dwell. You, who is faithful in all generations, just in judgments, wonderful in strength and majesty, with wisdom and creating and with understanding, fixing the things which were made, who art good among them that are being saved and faithful among them whose trust is in you. O merciful and compassionate one, forgive us our iniquities and offenses and transgressions and trespasses. Reckon not every sin of your servants and handmaids, but you will purify us with the purification of your truth and direct our steps that we may walk in holiness of heart and do what is good and well-pleasing in your sight and in the sight of our rulers. Yeah, Lord, make your face to shine upon us for good and peace, that we may be shielded by your mighty hand and delivered from every sin by your uplifted arm, and deliver us from those who hate us wrongfully. Give concord and peace to us all who dwell upon the earth, and even as you gave to our fathers, when they called upon you in faith and trust, submissive as we are to your almighty and all-excellent name to our rulers and governors on the earth, to them you, Lord, gave the power of the kingdom by your glorious and ineffable might, to the end that we may know the glory and honor given to them by you and be subject to them, in not resisting your will. To them, Lord, give health, peace, concord, and stability, that they may exercise the authority given to them without offense. 
For you, O heavenly Lord and King eternal, give us to the sons of men glory and honor and power over the things that are on the earth. Do thou, Lord, direct their counsel according to that which is good and well-pleasing in your sight, that devoutly in peace and meekness, exercising the power given them by you, they may be found, they may find you propitious. O thou who only has power to do these things and more abundant good with us, we praise you through the high priest and guardian of our souls, Jesus Christ, through whom be glory and majesty to you both now and from generation to generation and forevermore. Amen. I feel myself changing my opinion as I read that. That did have a lot of the elements of a Eucharistic prayer. I guess I don't really know the answer, so I, I shouldn't even offer an opinion. Very, well, It seems to have the elements of uh, offering intercession on behalf of the whole world, and the way it ended with that um, sort of doxology, kind of wrapping everything up in the praise of Christ. Who knows? It might have actually been taken from a Eucharistic prayer in Rome. Okay, conclusion, chapter 62 through 65. Concerning the things pertaining to our religious observance, which are both profitable for a life of goodness to those who would pursue a godly and righteous course, we have written to you, men and brethren, at sufficient length. For concerning faith and repentance and true love and continence and soberness and patience, we have touched upon every passage, putting you in mind that you ought in righteousness and truth and long suffering, to be well-pleasing to Almighty God with holiness, being of one mind, not remembering evil, in love and peace, with instant gentleness. Joy and gladness you will afford us if you become obedient to the words written by us through the Holy Spirit, root out the lawless wrath of your jealousy according to the intercession which we have made for peace and unity in this letter. Just notice he's saying they should be obedient to his words, which is, of course, asserting that he has authority over them, even though he is the Bishop of Rome, implying there is a primacy of the Bishop of Rome over the universal church. The concept of a patriarch didn't really exist yet, that Rome may have been the patriarch of the lesser church of Corinth. Besides, the church of Corinth and Rome were likely very similar sizes at this time. So if there was a concept of a patriarch, I'm sure the Bishop of Corinth would have seen himself as a sort of patriarch. Chapter 64. May God, who sees all things, and who is the ruler of all spirits and the Lord of all flesh, who chose our Lord Jesus Christ and us through him to be a peculiar people, grant to every soul that calls upon his glorious and holy name, faith, fear, peace, patience, long-suffering, self-control, purity, and sobriety, for the well-pleasing of his name, through our high priest and protector, Jesus Christ by whom be to him glory, majesty, and power, and honor, both now and forevermore. Amen. Conclusion. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, and with all everywhere that are called, that are the called of God through him, by whom be to him glory, honor, power, and majesty, and eternal dominion from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. To review. Clement lived his early years as a humble presbyter, declining the episcopacy until the time of crisis following Cletus' reign, when perhaps he saw that he needed to step up to help guide the Church of Rome during that difficult time. Clement was first and foremost a pastor. Clement recognized his duty to help shepherd the Church of Corinth, not just the Church of Rome. And themes of Clement's letter to the Corinthians include the awfulness of envy and rebellion and the need for humility and obedience. Let us conclude with a prayer in which we ask God to strengthen in our hearts everything that is good and remove from our hearts anything that is evil, especially anything that I might have said incorrectly today. In nomine Patri et Filii et Spiritui Sancti. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu en mulieribus et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobi peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis, nostre. Amen. God bless you, and I hope to see you soon. Have a great and happy new year.